Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me and GMAT Club today on this um, very important discussion as you um, perhaps some of you anxiously prepare for the MBA application for the upcoming cycle, whether that's in round one or in round two. Uh, today's topic is going to be covering uh, the MBA application preparation to put together a really strong candidacy um, as you embark on this journey as you prepare for the outcomes. And um, I'm here to talk about that. Uh, I also invite you to write your comments in the chat. Um, I'll see if we can engage as I'm presenting. So uh, please uh, write along in the comments uh, if you have any questions, uh, particularly for the slides that I will be covering. This way we can I can stop and, and just answer your questions directly. Uh, before we do that, uh, before I get started on the presentation, I just wanted to remind everyone, uh, first and foremost, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, uh, you know, join our um, uh, join the GMAT Club uh, community by subscribing to the channel if you have not. Also, as a reminder, there is the MBA Spotlight on June 11th and June 12th, um, and there is a link on the screen as well as in the comments as far as how you can register for that. Finally, if you want to talk with me about your MBA application journey, there will be a uh, link for a consultation um, uh, for, to have a conversation with me one-on-one -on -one about your candidacy and your profile um, and ways that I can support you on this journey. So with that, why don't we get started? I'm just going to make sure that my comments are front and center so this way I can monitor that as we proceed. So for those of you who do not know me, uh, I am the founder of C Admissions, uh, an MBA admission coaching firm uh, focused on helping applicants present their unique experiences uh, in a way that not only resonates with the individual as to who they are, but also that resonates with the admission team. Um, I work with a limited number of applicants every round, which allows me the time to coach them along the way, um, kind of a hand-holding process uh, as they put together their applications. Um, I will be talking today uh, about the MBA journey and what you need to be preparing for uh, in, or how do you use the next two months to really prepare a really strong application. And what I have on my agenda today is uh, we're gonna talk about prerequisite, shortlisting schools, identify what you're looking for and what the schools are looking for, as well as identify weaknesses and strengths in your profile and how you should be using the next um, uh, two months to prepare. Um, excellent. So let's get started. So for the uh, before you get started on shortlisting schools and uh, figuring out what you're going to write in the application, you do need a few components, and these are the prerequisites. You need to have a goal. So if you haven't done that, you need to start crafting your goal. What are your short and long term plans? I have many videos on my YouTube pl platform that talk about how to craft goals. So I invite you to look at that afterwards. You do need to have a baseline GMAT or GRE score. And uh, what that means is even if you haven't sat for an official exam, you know kind of where you're scoring in terms of um, you know, practice tests. Uh, this will help you determine where you are competitive and where you're not so competitive. What are your stretch schools and what are your um, safety schools, right? So you do need to have a baseline. Third thing you need, need to know what your GPA is. Uh, someone ha some have a very clear GPA that follow the American standard. Um, others have different education systems that have different standards. So you do need to know what conversions like uh, what what conversions are for those applicants in terms of uh, not an apples to apples, but also looking at where you stack up in, turn in terms of your um, class profile. So if you are top 10 percent, top 5 percent top 2% of your class, what does that look like? So that way, when you look at the class profile at your target institution, or when you're looking at institutions as a whole, um, you can understand what the number 
that you see in the class profile equates to in terms of your academic background. So the first three are prerequisites. Like you absolutely need those. You can't move forward without them. The third, uh, fourth thing, I guess, on the list is knowing yourself, knowing what you like, knowing what you dislike, knowing what you are um, interested in. So do you like to be in a community of individuals who are um, uh, very outgoing? Do you like to be more in a more studious kind of environment? Do you like to be in a city, in a college town? What are your likes and dislikes, right? Where do you thrive most? Also understanding your competition. Um, of course, you don't know what the future holds, but you should know what the class profile looks like. Where do you stack up of in, term of, in terms of applicants that are also applying? Are you an overrepresented candidate? Um, are you an underrepresented candidate? And that can sway the pendulum in terms of uh, which schools are reaches, <clears throat> excuse me, and which schools are safeties, right? So these are elements that you should be thinking about having a clear idea of what that um, looks like. And then of course, uh, you will be uh, having a better understanding of which schools you should be targeting and uh, how you present your story, et cetera. And we'll talk more about that. So with the prerequisites out of the way, now it's time to look at shortlisting your schools. Uh, you're gonna look at uh, the ranking and the reputation. Of course, we all care about ranking and it would be uh, erroneous to see it here and present it as, uh, you know, we shouldn't be thinking about ranking because ranking matters, right? Um, however, I have underlined reputation because reputation is more important in terms of um, what is the reputation of the school in the area that you're interested in. So when I talked about the prerequisite being your goals, well, you need to know what your goals are what community you want to be a part of, what conversations you want to be a part of when you are in a business school environment. And then you look at the reputation the institution has in that area that you're interested in. So for example, if you're interested in healthcare, but the school has very little, if any, healthcare sort of connections, then that school may rank really highly, but it may not be the right school for you in terms of your goals. So keep that in mind as you are shortlisting your schools. You also want to analyze the programs and their offerings. Um, that is, of course, the core requirements. Most everyone that's going through at least the top 20 business school is going to um, get a general MBA, right? You do need to have courses that are general MBA uh, that give you the designation of an MBA. Uh, however, the schools do recognize that not everyone is going on the same path and you do need some kind of exposure, especially if you're transitioning to something different than you've been doing before. Um, you do need exposure and specializations to understand that particular area of um, either business or sector or whatever it is that you're changing. So you want to look at what those specializations are in terms of allowing you the custom ability of your MBA to meet your goals. You'll hear me talk about goals often because an MBA is a tool helping you get to where you want to go in terms of your career. Um, and it should be thought of as such. It's not a, if I get into Harvard, it's all my problems are going to be solved, right? It's, yes, it's going to open many doors for you, but you still have to walk through those doors and you still have to have uh, build relationships, build a network, uh, and grow professionally to get to where you want to go. You also, in your shortlisting, should be looking at your the campus culture. This is something you will learn about through different forums, websites, videos that you watch in terms of uh, what schools are looking for, uh, excuse me, what the, the, the campus culture is like. And also when you speak to students and alumni, you'll get a sense of what the culture is like. But you do you know, want to understand what those are and how do they match with what you want out of an MBA or the kind of environment you want to be in an MBA. Um, then you're going to look at the alumni network. Like I said, the reputation of the school in the sector that you're interested in, if there's not many alumni in that area, is that the right school for you? Maybe it is but maybe it's not, and you should be looking at uh, making sure that the schools you're selecting are really helping you where you helping you get 
helping get you to where you want to go, excuse me, um, and uh, as opposed to just applying to as many M7s as possible, right? It really should be depth and purpose over a, a large quantity of applications being put out. And then, of course, career services. What are the opportunities in terms of how paved a path it has been for that particular sector that you're interested in or that uh, particular feel or, 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 or function that you want to have, um, how much support you have around um, that area that you're interested in. Um, so again, when I talk about prerequisite, you do need to have that written out uh, before you start your research to really understand what it is that you want and not be swayed by marketing tools that are on the school's website um, for, you know, that, that showcase what the school can offer. Um, of course, you're gonna use that to further refine your um, criteria, uh, but you first wanna start introspecting, you know, looking internally first before you start looking externally to find the matches, uh, find the schools that match exactly what you're looking for or close enough. You're probably not going to find an exact match um, because there's no such thing as perfect anything, um, but uh, close enough in terms of getting you uh, ticking all uh, most of the boxes that uh, you are interested in, in having. So what are business schools looking for? Um, you must understand at this point that you are putting together an application that is a marketing um, tool, essentially, to present your case to the admission team, telling them that you are their ideal candidate that should be admitted to their program and be able to attend. That is essentially what you are putting together. This is not your life story. This is not uh, your autobiography. Um, this is business school application that is saying to the admission team, here are my credentials. This is what I, this is what I have done. This is what I've accomplished. Look how awesome I am. You should admit me, right? Uh, in, in, in other words, <laughs> right? So in order to be able to effectively do that, you do need to understand who you're marketing to, right? Uh, if you're marketing, if you're in the marketing space, you definitely understand this very well. Um, so, to understand uh, who you're marketing to, you want, need to understand what their admission criteria are um, of your target business school. A lot of them do post this online. They have principles or characteristics that they're looking for in candidates. You need to study that. Uh, you need to an analyze that. You need to watch many videos. You need to attend their webinars and really understand what they're looking for um, in order to be able to capture how your experiences translate to what it is that they're looking for. Uh, you're also going to connect with current students and, and recent alumni uh, to understand what does it feel like to be on campus. That is the closest you can get in terms of understanding what it feels like to be an MBA student before getting to an MBA program. Uh, therefore, you need to have as many conversations as possible with students and recent alumni to get a feel of what kind of projects they're working on, what kind of experiences and exposures they have, um, what they like, what they dislike in the program, in the community, so that you can really get a robust mental image of what it feels like to be a student there. It's not just about knowing these details or researching the website. It's really about understanding what it is that they're looking for, how does that show up on campus, so that you can reflect back to them how you match those criteria in your profile and your application. You're also going to look at what the class profile is um, in terms of, um, you know, where are the students coming from, what their backgrounds are pre-MBA, what their undergraduate trainings have been, um, what obviously the GMAT, the GRE, those kinds of components, and then where you stack up in terms of that, obviously recognizing that you need to also layer your, um, uh, uh, how, how competitive you are in terms, or the, the demographic that you are applying uh, with. So if you're an overrepresented candidate, and the average class um, uh, GMAT is in the classic uh, classic edition uh, is the 730. If you're overrepresented, well, we all know that 750 is kind of where you need to be 
uh, where you need to be scoring in order to attend the top of the line business schools. So or be competitive at least uh, for top of the line business schools. Uh, so you do need to recognize that there's many layers to the application process. Um, then you also um, want to surround yourself with people that um, also know the school to the extent that you can, of course. So if you're working with a coach that is a, that understands the schools and understands uh, what they're looking for, has sent um, uh, applicants or candidates there, then obviously they're going to be guiding you through the entire process. But it's also recognized or understandable that not everyone can afford an admission coach. Um, and you do want to then have a, um, uh, have guides or have mentors, students that have attended, um, maybe colleagues that have attended the schools that you're targeting. So at least get an understanding of what the business schools are looking for uh, so that you're mindful in how you present your story um, there. I would say strongly encourage everyone that uh, you keep meticulous notes on every school. Uh, there's always a point in which applicants journey in the applicant journey where uh, applicants are confused. What's the difference between the schools? Uh, once you keep meticulous notes and you're, you will see the patterns, you will see the differences that will help you put together an application that is in line with what business schools are looking for. Okay, so let's continue. Um, after you know, okay, what are your, uh, what business schools you're looking to target, uh, it is also an opportunity to reflect on yourself. What are your strengths and what are your weaknesses in terms of the application? Um, you can always start by uh, introspection in terms of your past experiences. Uh, you do have to go back all the way to college. So whenever college was for you, you want to lo look at those experiences. That means your extracurriculars in college, since college, uh, your work experiences, um, your internships are not really that important, especially if you've had five years of work experience or more. Uh, so you look at what your experiences have been since you graduated college. Have you been involved in any extracurriculars since then? So you want to have a, a retrospection on or an introspection on your, your, your past. Uh, it's always a, for those applicants who are working in organizations that are that give feedback sort of, um, you know, consistently, uh, you should be looking at uh, those, those, those reports, the, 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 the feedback that you received from your uh, direct supervisors, whoever those may be, um, and look as far back as you can find in terms of as far back as it goes, uh, to not only look at what kind of feedback you got about your, your candidacy, your how strong of an employee you are, uh, but also look at the feedback in areas that you need to develop, uh, because that can help you also understand how much you've grown since that feedback was given to you. So if you have four years of experience and the first feedback is like six months after you started working at that company, and you see how much you've grown, well, that's not only going to help you in terms of putting together a strong application, but it's also going to help you guide your recommenders um, in that feedback question that, ev that everyone struggles with, right? Um, so first is looking backwards. Then it's also looking at, you know, what are the areas that you need to develop? Um, do you have um, uh, weak academic performance? Do you have, uh, you know, not much leadership experience? Uh, have you had an opportunity to uh, illustrate that you are collaborative? Uh, have you had an opportunity to advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion? This is an assessment of your entire profile. And it's not about making yourself look, at this point, it's not about making yourself look good. It's really assessing where your weaknesses lie. Um, and also, if you struggle, ask your peers, especially the ones that you trust, right? I, I put that in parentheses. It's really important to ask people that you trust uh, you trust their feedback, uh, that they're going to give you um, real constructive feedback in areas that you need to develop. They're not going to sugarcoat things for you because it's not really helpful in this process. Um, and I didn't include 
mentors you trust because I'm assuming the mentors that you're working with are people that you actually trust their opinion. Uh, mentors, you want to ask them also for feedback in, uh, in terms of what they like about your candidacy, what they like about your character, where are the successes that they see, but then also where are the weaknesses in your profile that they see in terms of however long they've been your mentors. Um, from there, you also want to evaluate your academic record and standardized tests in relation to the class profile. Like I said earlier, um, if your uh, you know, GPA um, is low, well, you know, there's not much you can do. You can't go back to college and change that. But you can do something about your GMAT or the GRE test that you are putting forth to the admission team in terms of really studying, working with people, uh, tutors or whoever are taking classes to help you really get to the score that you know you're capable of delivering um, and in evaluating like is that a weakness is that a strength are you on par in terms of uh, evaluation in, in the class profile um, that is something that um, will allow you to make a plan forward in terms of what do you need to do do you need to retake that test do you need to take a class do you need to you know uh, join Harvard Business School's core uh, program uh, and, and what do you need to do uh, to be a very competitive uh, candidate? Uh, there's a question, do career gaps three to four years while pursuing my undergrad and low academic grades matter while applying for top grad schools provided that one has good GMAT and TOEFL scores? Everything matters in the application process so uh, you have a three to four years gap. I'm assuming that's an undergraduate. So that's not considered a gap if you're going and completing your degree. Um, but if you have a gap since your undergraduate, meaning for three to four years after you've completed your undergraduate, you haven't worked, then that actually matters a lot because it's something that employers are going to be asking as well. Um, so you do need to have an explanation as to what happened during that period of time. Uh, you know, academic grades do matter, but if it has been several years since you've applied, uh, since you were in college and uh, or university, and and uh, uh, you know that you're not no longer that same person in terms of your capabilities and how engaged you are, then um, it matters. But you can you can submit. Um, a really strong above class average GMAT um, uh, to help with that. It's not going to replace it. It's just going to show them that you are not lo no longer the same person. And I would probably say, do take a, a class that has a credit associated with it. So Harvard core program, it's an excellent program. It's a pre-MBA preparation. Uh, highly regarded in all top schools. Um, so that could be something that you plan for. But know that that's between, I think, 12 and 17 weeks of of class time that you need to prepare, um, which means you need to start as soon as possible in order to have that certificate by the time you submit your application. Uh, there is another question that says, I have a year gap, but was due to COVID. Um, one year gap is okay. You do need to explain what happened during that year. What did you do in that year? Especially if it was COVID, um, you know, you shouldn't have been just waiting and doing nothing. You should be showcasing that you did something in relation to strengthening your candidacy and strengthening your profile. Um, COVID is something we have all experienced, so there's an understanding associated with it. Uh, but you can't just assume that they will understand. You do have to explain it in the optional essay for that. OK, let's continue. So in the next two months, this is to strengthen your weaknesses. So if your GMAT or GRE is low, you need to create a study plan. And you need to take that very seriously, work with tutors, take a class, um, do whatever you need to do to make sure that you get that score um, higher than it currently is, or at least in the, in the range of the target schools that you are applying to. Um, all should apply to some reach schools, whatever reach is for you. Um, but your aim should be the ones that you consider to be your target schools. Um, you should be in the range of their GMAT, GMAT GRE class profile 
um, for those that you you really um, are a perfect fit for, even if it's not a reach school. If you have weak professional experiences, what I mean by that, you don't show leadership, you haven't shown, uh, you know, uh, opportunity to 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 demonstrate that you have the potential for a stronger future career, then you need to ask for greater uh, greater um, responsibilities. Uh, you do not need to tell your supervisor that you're applying to an MBA program, but you can say something like, you know, I really want to grow within the organization. I really want to have more impact here. Are there opportunities for me to strengthen my involvement? And those that for most bosses, that's music to their ears. So you can definitely approach that very comfortably, um, especially if you're doing well relatively in other responsibilities. So, you know, if you are performing well in your day-to-day -day responsibilities, or if you want more responsibilities, they're typically open to it. But if you're not really doing so well in your day-to-day -day responsibilities and you ask for more, then that's typically a bit of a challenge. Um, if you are weak in your written communication, which means um, you are not really strong at capturing what it is that you want to say, seek for a coach. Uh, that's really, really important. I oftentimes see this um, uh, in applicants. Uh, more often than not is when I have a conversation with them, it is very exciting. They are really interested in, in or, or they have a lot to share in terms of what, what they have accomplished. Uh, and then I read their materials and I am totally left uninspired. Uh, not that you need to inspire the admission team, but you do need to showcase that you are a really strong, um, uh, strong candidate and you do that first through a written material, right? So through your resume, through your essays, through your short answer questions. Um, and that's really important as part of marketing, right? Marketing your story. Uh, so you need a coach. If you can't afford a coach, look for people in your community that can read your materials um, and also recognize that, um, you know, they, they will have limitations as far as how much they can read. Um, so you may need a couple of people to support your applications on that front. Um, if you have weak presentation skills, so meaning you are not strong in terms of uh, delivering, or like in an interview or delivering presentations uh, orally, or um, uh, you're not strong in videos, right? Um, you should be, uh, or, or the other component is if you're an international applicant and English is not your day-to-day -day, uh, language of communication, you want to join the likes of a Toastmasters in your local community to practice, right? That is a low stakes kind of practice versus showing up in the interview and in your video that you're submitting to the schools that you're targeting um, that is high stakes in terms of the MBA application uh, journey. Uh, and you can do all these things in the next two months. Um, if you're struggling to present experiences um, in a way that capture what you have accomplished, um, ask for help early. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you if you think that, okay, you can submit an application in one month preparation time, you shouldn't, but let's just assume that that's the case because I hear that often. Um, uh, but you're expecting someone else to give you feedback, well, you also have to take account, take into account their time because they may not be available at the moment that you submit your material to review for them. So you do need to plan that out in terms of how much material are you going to send out, who you're going to send it out to, what's their availability, are they going to be available, what's their turnaround time? These are important questions to ask. If you have weak extracurricular experiences, look for opportunities to um, have quick wins. So what I mean by this is uh, you shouldn't be looking at extracurriculars that will take you one year to actually have many, any kind of contribution uh, because you have two months left essentially. Uh, and in order to do it, you, um, in order to engage in it, you should be able to talk about it in your applications and then obviously in the interview as well. Uh, so you look for quick wins in terms of what are some projects that are taking place that you can volunteer in terms of your time, in, term of, in terms of your expertise. Um, the easiest, typically the easiest way to do that is to look in your current organization 
and um, identify uh, some projects that are currently taking place that they need support in terms of uh, driving it home. Uh, look for those quick wins and engage in the next two months to be able to demonstrate how you have supported them. You're obviously not pioneering anything here. You're not launching anything yourself, but you are supporting them and can still be able to provide some kind of impact. If you have weak letters of recommendation, this is this means that you haven't been prioritizing um, your network. And it's a, as an MBA candidate, it's really important that you prioritize your network. Uh, I had a, I interviewed uh, uh, Ify Walker, uh, an executive coach, yesterday on my YouTube channel. So if you guys want to go and watch that. Um, and she talked about, essentially, how in order to get to a C-suite level, you do need to prioritize your network because your networks are gonna, your, your strong network is gonna be your champion, the ones that are gonna, um, you know, uh, help you get to the future that you want. And your letters of recommendation are the first champions of your MBA journey. Um, so if you haven't had strong relationships, this is the time that you need to start working on those relationships. So look who your recommenders are. How can you strengthen those relationships? How can you show them that you are? Um, a really strong candidate. And sometimes this may mean um, if it takes me a little extra time to submit a really strong letter of recommendation and it means I apply in round two, you have to do that because without strong letters of recommendation, your chances of admission are very slim. I see a few other questions. So let me stop for a moment. Um, uh, I want to know if signing up for a pre-MBA course or a specific or say behavioral economics or project management is a good, good idea to take before applications. Um, yes, especially if you have weak um, GMAT undergraduate um, performance, uh, that can definitely help strengthen your application. Uh, I would look at classes that are strongest in terms of showcasing your quantitative abilities. Um, I mentioned earlier the the HBS core at like the golden the gold standard in terms of like pre MBA courses um, that you can enroll in, but there are definitely cheaper versions uh, that you can enroll in afterward uh, as well. Uh, you do need to have a certificate bearing course, so it can't be um, it shouldn't be like a Coursera course to be honest, because they're not that high value courses, because um, there's no test that you take in terms of like someone is actually grading your test, grading your performance there. Um, uh, so, so that's something that to keep in mind. However, if you have strong GPA and GMAT or GRE, use your time on your applications. Uh, this is about quality of applications. Uh, versus quantity, and you do need time to put together strong applications. So th this is in relation to the overall profile um, that you need to decide where your time is going to be most beneficial. Because if you take courses and if you focus on getting that perfect GMAT or GRE, and you haven't spent time putting together a strong marketing collateral for your own candidacy, uh, that's not going to be a strong application in terms of like outcomes uh, once you apply. So keep that uh, uh, keep that in mind as you pave the path forward. Uh, you coordinated three nonprofits, absolutely leadership. Um, you can uh, make sure that you demonstrate the outcomes of the coordinations that you have done. Um, what kind of impact you are able to make? So, but absolutely, that's leadership. Uh, uh, can an MBA candidate also do a dual degree, for example, one in computer science? Uh, a lot of schools have dual degree options. Um, so absolutely uh, look at the schools, again, in the range that you're looking at and what those dual degree options that they offer. Um, every school is slightly different as far as what opportunities are there. Um, so I have worked at a startup for two years and have helped raise millions of dollars as well. Amazing, that's perfect. Make sure that you capture that in your application, in your resume, short answers. Maybe your interest is to work in startup related to computer science. There is a way that you can tie those experiences together to tell a cohesive story that makes you stand out, makes you authentic applicant. That's great. Um, 
does a 3.0, I guess, GPA matter in CV? I don't know if I fully understand the question, but um, if you have a 3.0 GPA, I wouldn't mention it in your CV. But uh, uh, if you have a 3.0 GPA, irrespective of mentioning it or not, you do have to demonstrate that you are a strong candidate to the schools that you're applying to. So that means your GMAT or the GRE needs to be really strong, and you may want to consider taking a course. Um, I already mentioned Harvard's. You can take Berkeley Haas's Extension School, Math Management. Um, these are all courses that are intended to help you uh, prepare for an MBA application and demonstrate that you are ready for that next step in your career. Um, one more question. So uh, if I have experience using data and quantitative analysis and my recommender can speak to this, do I need to take a course? I received a BA in statistics, a B, excuse me, in statistics in undergrad and an A in data analytics. Um, no, I don't think you need a course um, to demonstrate this, especially if you can demonstrate it in your day-to-day -day job and your recommenders can vouch for that. Um, a B is fine <laughs> if the overall application is uh, is uh, is strong. Um, so again, it's it's all dependent on the full picture. Excellent. Okay, so let's continue. I think I have one more slide. All right, so next two months, what you should be doing. All of this is precursor to these, this slide. Um, important thing to remember that an application, a strong application, um, add that, right? Because we're not here to submit weak applications. We're here to submit strong applications. Um, can't or are not typically built overnight. This means it's an iterative process. It means it's a continuous development. Uh, your mind is constantly thinking about experiences, is thinking about how you can tell those stories, what other elements you can add to your stories. Um, it's not a, I'm gonna sit here for two hours and work on my resume and it's done kind of experience. It's really, I'm gonna sit here for two hours, work on it, put it aside, come back tomorrow, sit here for two hours and do it again. That's the kind of, um, experience the MBA journey is like. So uh, what I suggest that you do is you, you know, essentially put together a checklist and map it out in terms of when you need to be doing, uh, when you need to complete different components of the application. You are setting yourself up for success in terms of giving your own self deadlines. Don't leave an open ended until the application date. Um, uh, because, uh, you know, there, someone once told me that, you know, if you give yourself two hours to clean your apartment, uh, you'll be able to do it in two hours. And if you give yourself a week, you'll do it in a week, right? So make sure that you give yourself some time, but do so in a way that you recognize what are all the things that you need to do. And then Make sure that you have deadlines when you need to get your resume done, when you need to get your letters of recommendation, uh, you know, guidance that you're going to provide to them. When does that need to take place? When are you going to write your essays? When are you going to write your short answer responses? When are you going to prepare videos? Anything that related to your school's application, um, you want to map that out and have a checklist associated with it. Uh, also, I will say you want to understand the prompts. I know the prompts are not out yet officially, but they will be coming out in the next week or so, and or next two weeks. So let's say beginning, you know, beginning to mid of June, you're going to start seeing essay prompts um, be released. So um, it's really important to understand what the prompt is and what they're asking of you. Um, I'm going to use Harvard common question that they always ask, which is, um, as we evaluate your candidacy, what else should we know, essentially? I'm paraphrasing, of course. So that's a very open-ended question. And oftentimes, I hear applicants that are going on this journey talk about, um, oh, I'm going to share this amazing experience where I was able to do this awesome thing. The what else is the key word here, right? What that means is, we read your resume. We read your letters of recommendation. We read your short answer questions in the application portal. What do we want? What do we need to know that we already don't know about you that we should consider as we evaluate your candidacy? So this means you should not be writing a, a, a written out form of your resume in your essay, in your Harvard essay, right? 
understand what Harvard is looking for in terms of their, their pillars and their, their criteria of a candidate that they're looking for. Um, so you want to give yourself time to analyze what is it that they're looking for, and then, of course, map out and plan out how you're going to respond in terms of the question that they're asking. I see this all the time in my eight plus years of experience doing this. Applicants always under underestimate the amount of time it takes to put together an application. If you think it's going to take you one month to write your essays, <laughs> block two. So double the amount of time that you think you need in terms of the application and front load yourself with the work because that will make sure that you give yourself some buffer time. Uh, you don't want an application that is rushed because as soon as you hit that submit, all the things you did wrong will come to mind and you're going to panic. You haven't submitted your application in the best way possible. You're inundating the admission team with questions about, can I change this and can I change that in the application? Obviously, none of these make you look good in, in uh, top ranked business schools where they can choose from the best of the best. Um, the other thing that I will say, so once you have your map and uh, your checklist and you understand the prompts, um, you also want to plan daily application commitments. So I'm using the words like that. It's like you are committing to yourself that every single day you're going to work on your MBA application. Uh, this is not about the GMAT or the GRE. This is aside from the GMAT or the GRE. And every single one of you can dedicate at least 15 minutes every single day to your MBA application. There's no one here that should say that, oh, no, I don't have time to do that. Um, you should be, if, if that's your answer, you need an answer, um, remove Instagram, remove TikTok, <laughs> remove uh, Facebook and any of those apps, social media apps that you have on your phone. Remove those for the, until, you know, whenever you're applying uh, because you will find yourself having 15 minutes to dedicate to your application. And it's really important for a couple of reasons. One is to make sure that you are taking this process very seriously. There is forward progress. It's easier to give yourself 15 minutes than to give yourself two hours. There is habits that you're building in terms of every single day I have to do this. And it's always best if it's on at the same time. Um, you are giving yourself time to iterate your materials, to think about your materials in between sessions that you have, um, and you're not leaving everything until July or August, right? When applications are due and you're going to realize that you don't have time to put it together. Then give yourself also time to edit and weave, weave your full story into the application. And what I mean by that is when you first have a prompt and you decide this is what I'm going to be writing about, uh, it typically, that's the skeleton of what you're going to write. To make it authentic, to make it dynamic essay, you need to weave the stories that you have in your head that no one else knows, or at least the admission team does not know, needs to be woven into your application. So your first drafts are really more around the structure and the storyline. And then later drafts are more around weaving the complexities and the experiences and exposures that have made you who you are and made you think in the way that you thought and approach things in the way you have approached things, right? So give yourself, recognize that those are components that you'll need to do in your plan um, as far as uh, putting together, uh, working on in the next two months. Um, and then, of course, you want to identify who are the people that you're going to be asking for feedback. Uh, again, if you're working with a coach, you need to identify them, start working with them, because there's elements that they need to know before you even start writing your essays in terms of who you are, what experiences you've had, build a strategy, understand what um, the storyline is going to be, even if you haven't started writing your essays yet, right? Um, and then also plan for the feedback. And if you're not working with a coach, who are the people that you're going to work with that are going to read your materials? Obviously, you need, you know, if you're not paying someone, to be honest, you, if you're not paying someone, they're not going to be able to read, um, you know, 13 different drafts of your one of your essays to Harvard, right? You're going to want to uh, 
have several people that read your materials and plan for feedback, recognize what their schedule looks like, what can, uh, how, how soon can you expect feedback from them? What's their, like if they have big projects they're working on, they may take a week to get back to you while you just lost a week on working on that material, right? So you definitely want to uh, plan that out and recognize that you will need people supporting you in this process um, because the worst thing is if all you have done is put together an application that you think is good and no one else has read, right? Because you know your full story, you're filling in gaps that the admission team and other people will not be able to fill um, in terms of your thought process, right? Uh, so uh, plan those out for the next two months. Every single week, there should be forward progress on your application. Um, every single day should be worked on your application materials for at least 15 minutes and identify your advisory board, <laughs> the people who are going to support you along the way, uh, whether that's, you know, bouncing ideas, whether that's reading your essays, reading your resume, uh, recommenders, obviously, that are going to be writing letters of recommendation as well. All right, one more question, and I know we're stretching on a very long session today, but I uh, wanted to make sure that I answer uh, additional questions. Um, okay, so let's see what questions do I have here. Uh, I think, I don't think I answered this one. So does a master's degree after undergrad play a role in evaluation also? Uh, so first, let me answer that part. Um, in terms of the evaluation, um, it does not necessarily play a role in terms of like uh, the GPA that is calculated is your undergrad. Um, but it does, especially if you performed really well in your master's degree, it can help uh, in overall story that you know, your, your GPA in undergrad, for example, um, wasn't as great because of these extenuating circumstances. And here is my master's degree where I did really well, where those extenuating circumstances were no longer part of the picture. So you can help tell your story. Second part, will having only two years of experience derail my hopes for a top 15 school despite having good GMAT? Um, two years of experience uh, is this uh, that you currently have or that you will have a matriculation? It's a difference because if you currently have two years, that means you'll have three years by matriculation, um, which, I mean, you're on the younger side, um, but it's, it's okay. Um, if you will have two years of matriculation and you, that means you only have one year currently of work experience, uh, I suggest that you wait um, at least another year to apply because it will increase your chances of getting into a top program. It's important to remember this is not just another master's degree. You can get you know, typically an MBA only once. Um, this is something you will use for the rest of your life. And you do want to give yourself um, the best chances of getting the best program, getting into the best program for the strongest network that you can leverage time and time again as you progress in your career. So. You know, sometimes slowing down in terms of making sure that you're submitting when you have a really strong candidacy can be a better outcome than uh, rushing an application when you're when you when you can't really demonstrate. Uh, and maybe you can. So um, take this with a grain of salt because uh, I don't know your full story. But um, if you can't demonstrate to the admission team that you're ready for an MBA program, um, that uh, can be definitely a challenge in conversion as well. Okay, we have one more question. Um, and if uh, anyone has questions, we're coming to a close. So please write your questions down um, now. So that way I can uh, uh, be sure to answer all of them. Uh, so the next question is, I want to give my GMAT this year, but I want to apply for MBA two years later. If I quit my job this year and work on some other project, would that be fine? Um, I'm not sure why you want to quit your job. Uh, quitting your job for studying purposes, it's not really going to look good on your application. Um, in terms of uh, everyone that's going on this journey, it's going through the same thing that you are going through, meaning they're working full time and they're taking the test as well. Especially if you're not planning to apply for an MBA for another two years, there shouldn't be a reason why you quit your job 
it always takes a while to get another job, um, especially a job that is a quality job in terms of the kind of experiences that you want to have. So I highly advise against quitting your job to study for the GMAT um, uh, because it's typically not, uh, not going to work in your favor in terms of um, demonstrating to the admission team that uh, you can handle a lot of work thrown at you, which is part of the journey, unfortunately. Um, okay, so next question. Does a working as an independent consultant have an impact on the profile? 32 is a, on the higher end. It will still be okay if we're targeting the best business schools. Um, so as part of the evaluation process, uh, admission teams are looking at essentially what your goals are, what is it that you want to do, what does your past look like, who are the employers that you've worked for, um, are they going to help them help you get the job that you want in terms of your goals short and long term. Um, uh, as an independent consultant, uh, it can be sometimes difficult to demonstrate unless you're consulting for um, brand name institutions, uh, then there's a story there. So um, I, I would definitely need to know more about your background to be able to coach you on that front. Uh, 32, you're okay. Um, in terms of getting into a top program, uh, so long as you're not looking to go into consulting. <laughs> uh, that's on a, that's the higher end as far as like goals are concerned. Uh, so there's definitely uh, a story. I mean, you can definitely rely on your experiences and the impact you've been able to make as an independent consultant, um, but storytelling is going to be an important component in getting into a top uh, business school. All right, I think this is the final question, um, unless another one comes in as I am answering this one. So applying directly after undergrad is good. Mm, based on skills learned from outside coursework without work experience. Uh, business schools in the US require a minimum of two years work, two years of full-time work experience to be eligible for an MBA program. Um, so, without any work experience, you are ineligible to apply to an MBA program in the United States. If you're applying to an um, MIM program, that's a different story because that is for people without work experience, but for the full-time MBA program, um, to start the program immediately, you do need two years of work experience. Um, if you are applying to the deferred, pro deferred program, the deferred program is essentially you're working, you're, Securing your seat at a top-ranked institution in the final year, in your final year of your university, so you can start two years down the line, minimum, right? So you still need the two years of work experience before you can start an MBA program as well. Hopefully that answers the question. I see more questions come in. That's perfect. Um, oh. Let's see. What did I miss? Okay. So applicants in early 30s are at disadvantage if they're aiming for consulting IB post MBA. Um, it's more challenging uh, to convert, uh, uh, you know, for consulting as far as your goals are concerned. Uh, it's not impossible, but it's definitely more challenging. Will you call it late if someone is, is uh, starting the application from June 1st? Uh, no, not necessarily. You're not giving yourself a lot of time, but it's not late to start on June 1st. Uh, you, uh, but it, it means that you do have to be very, very diligent in putting together the different pieces of the application um, so that you can start, so you can target it early September start, uh, submission date. Uh, obviously, this depends a little bit on the schools that you're applying because each one of them has its own um, admission criteria. Okay. Uh, so why will it be negative to consulting at age 32? Um, 
it's not that it's necessarily negative to um, uh, to to start at age 32, but if you think about it, you'll be 34 by the time you graduate. Um, and the average class is 28. Uh, they will be 30 by the time they graduate and get into consulting. Um, so you are four years um, older than the applicant, uh, than the, the typical applicant. Um, there's a lot of grind that happens in the consulting world. Uh, uh, and the older you get, um, it's a little bit more difficult to um, go through those processes. I don't set the rules. Um, it's not that it's a hard cut rule, by the way. Um, it's more that it becomes more more challenging for admission teams to say, oh, you're looking to get into an MBB. Uh, you're looking to get into a big four. Um, yeah, you know, at 30, 32, 34, you'll be able to do that. It's going to be difficult for them because they see this, the, the story around who is getting into those uh, jobs. And uh, for them, you know, they're, when they're looking at your candidacy, they're looking at not just what you bring to the table, but also their ability to help you get to where you want to go. Um, so it's it's really from that perspective that I'm looking at it. Okay. I think I answered um, the question. Uh, so if you want to watch the replay, then afterwards you can look. I, I don't want to mention your name, so it doesn't become a permanent record on, on this video when it's its replace. Uh, but the person who was asking for if I answered the question, I have answered the question. So you can go back and, and watch uh, watch the replay. Um, excellent. So I already talked about consulting. Hopefully that gives you some perspective on um, age and consulting <laughs> careers, short term at least. Um, and hopefully this session was helpful. Uh, we definitely stretched that to almost an hour. Uh, so I thank you for being present. Uh, and I would say, uh, if you like this video, if you like content like this, uh, please give it a thumbs up. It helps us understand what you guys need so we can continue to create uh, free resources uh, for applicants to gain insight as they prepare their application. Thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you next time.